President Duque, thank you so much for joining us. It's a great honor uh, to have you as a part of this uh, program. And I would like to begin uh, by congratulating you on your election, uh, which is not all that long ago. And my first question uh, about the climate crisis is about the impacts already being felt by uh, Colombia in the form of floods and landslides and rising temperatures. Uh, what uh, communities in Colombia have you found to be most vulnerable to the climate crisis? Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Gore, for this invitation. For me, it's a great pleasure to participate in this dialogue with you. And as you know, Colombia has taken climate change seriously, not only adapting, but also uh, adopting the right policies to prevent the impacts of climate change. We have a climate change law, we have a climate change policy, and we have articulated the work of all public and private agencies in order to be more efficient in preventing the, the, the impact on climate change. Now, on your specific question, we have more than 190 municipalities that are highly exposed to the effects of climate change. And this obviously creates a, a great vulnerability because we have floods in some uh, seasons of the year, and we also have the lack of, of rain in other periods. So both issues are critical, and what we have done in Colombia is adapt and prevent. So with those communities at this stage, we want to create a conscience on protecting national resources and be able to, to protect, for example, in the case of floods, that they uh, generate uh, national disasters. We have done this in municipalities with the mayors. We have invited the private sector. And I think the adaptation policy that we have been implementing is producing positive results. However, we also need to do much better in regions that are in the far lands of Colombia, where there's not enough resources. So we're trying now to articulate with the private sector the support to those communities. So in a nutshell, the policies that we have are good, but the great challenge that we have is to mobilize the right resources so that we can make adaptation even stronger and more successful. Well, I admire the leadership you are providing in confronting this crisis, and the pattern you describe is the same as is being seen in countries around the world. L big downpours causing floods and landslides, uh, and then long periods uh, without rain where the extra heat makes the droughts take hold more quickly. In my country and in most countries around the world, we find that it is the poor who are hurt the most and have the least resources to adapt on their own. Uh, are you finding that to be the situation in Colombia also? Yes, definitely. I mean, people who are more vulnerable in income and also the people that are more vulnerable to the impact of natural disasters that are derived from the effects of climate change. So that's why in the coastal areas we need to do much better. We need to prevent uh, coastal erosion. That's why we also need to identify the right policies to protect the ocean shores in, in Colombia. And obviously, uh, to prevent landslides when we have uh, high accumulations of rain, that's also very important. And it also, also has to do with the type of urban planning policies so that we don't have housing that is exposed to those vulnerabilities. Obviously, that requires readaptation of the national planning uh, policies in a specific territories. It also has to do with the housing policy. Mm. It also has to do with the type of materials that are needed to prevent those houses for the vulnerable to be highly exposed. And it also requires us to have a conscience in a specific regions of the country when we need to move people that are living close to the river shores wow. and are highly exposed when we have an increase on the level of the rivers in Colombia derived from climate change effects. So yes, this is a major problem for the vulnerable people. And that's why with the policy that we have presented and the one that we're going to present in, the, in our national plan next year is to have the full Colombian population conscience on how to protect the national resources, how to recycle, reduce, reuse, how to manage uh, uh, disposal materials, 
and how to make the conscience in each community that the river shores have to be prevented and that no housing can be exposed close to the river shores because otherwise it would maybe generate a national disaster when it comes to high floods. So all this has to be part of a, of a national agenda. We have to bring resources to the table and that's why jointly we want to put resources from the state ask the local governments to do the same and invite the private sector to participate in the prevention, specifically in those 119 municipalities that are very low income communities so that they're not highly exposed to have a, a massive losing of lives because we have not adopted. So adaptation hand in hand with those policies, I think will produce the results that we're expecting. Mm. Well, once again, I'm very impressed with your leadership Another problem that Colombia shares in common with so many other countries around the world is that when fossil fuels are burned, including diesel and, and petrol, that not only makes the climate crisis work worse, it also contributes to deadly levels of air pollution in cities. And I understand in Colombia, in fact, some rural areas also have this uh, extreme problem. Yes. So uh, could you tell us about uh, Colombia's plans for reducing the burning of fossil fuels and switching to cleaner forms of energy? Well, thank you for that question, Mr. Gore, because uh, one of the main objectives that I want to reach during my administration is to change the Colombia energy matrix. Mm. Right now, 75% of our energy is produced primarily from hydro. And uh, we have in Colombia something close to 16,600 megawatts of installed capacity for energy producing. And we have less than 50 megawatts devoted to renewable energies. Mm. One of the goals we want to achieve by the end of my term in 2022 is that we pass the weight of renewables from less than 50 megawatts to more than 1,500 megawatts. Wow. So that will be a big step in having a, a more, di more diversified energy matrix and a cleaner energy matrix. And obviously this has to do with the expansion of solar power and, and also with wind power, but it also has to go hand in hand with other policies that are regarding mobility in cities. One of the main decisions that we want to address is that by the year 2040, most of the, of, of the cars in Colombia uh, will be electrical. So we're starting to move along those lines, and we also want to have massive transportation, massive public transportation, moving to uh, a cleaner energy sources. With that, we will have an impact, obviously, on, on air pollution and air quality, but we also need to create the conscience of people using cleaner vehicles mm -hmm. and at the same time uh, uh, promoting solutions as carpooling and also being able to have more use of bicycles in cities. As you well know, Bogota, the capital of Colombia, is one of the cities in Latin America, if not the one, with the, with the most uh, bicycle lines across the city. And we also want cities to, to keep on embracing those type of policies. And we're trying to do that in, in, even in rural areas. But this is a way so that we can create a social conscience on why air pollution is so important. And I must also address that uh, cities in Colombia, such as Medellin, are having a daily monitoring of the quality of air and air pollution and they're taking decisions that have become part of the, of the social conscience so that when there's a high accumulation of pollution, people receive an, an alert mm -hmm. and they act promptly, not going with cars or even making some restrictions oh. in the vehicle circulation. I think those kinds of, of efforts are very important and it goes hand in hand with our broader policy mm -hmm. of having a cleaner energy matrix and a, and a high motivation of expanding uh, solar and wind power in our matrix. Well, that's very exciting and encouraging. Uh, all over the world, uh, we're finding that young people, this rising generation is demanding a, a better world and a better future. And they're using these internet connected uh, air pollution monitors and building this uh, awareness that you speak of. 
But I wanted to ask another question about the shift to clean energy. Here in the United States, uh, solar jobs are growing nine times faster than other jobs in the economy. And the second fastest growing job is wind energy turbine technician. Are you finding uh, the opportunity to create new jobs and new employment opportunities with this shift to clean energy and electric vehicles? Yes, definitely. And that's why we also believe that we should have some tax incentives for corporations that are uh, being uh, started in Colombia. Startups in, in clean energy should have some fiscal incentives so that they can create jobs and also have impact in different parts of the country. We have seen the example in the United States, which is very impressive, how in the last uh, 15 years, the, the expansion of corporations and the expansion of jobs in, in clean energy are very important, and you have created uh, this term called green growth. And we want to introduce green growth as part of our national planning exercise for the next four years. So in fact, yes, we want to give the incentives. We want to see more corporations generating jobs in these areas. But also, we want to, to even go farther. We strongly believe that, for example, in rural areas, we need to create a conscience that I describe in one phrase, produce conserving and conserve producing, mm -hmm. so that any productive effort in the rural areas goes hand in hand with the idea of being efficient, managing all the resources, and having a positive impact on climate change. And let me just raise one issue. For example, in, in, in the case of, uh, of our um, uh, the amount of, uh, of animals that we have for uh, milk producing in Colombia or for meat producing in Colombia. We have uh, something close to 26 uh, million animals, and they use more than 30 uh, million hectares. Mm. So the idea is to make a reduction, a substantial reduction on the area so that there is a sustainable production so that we use less area, more rotation, and uh -huh. better efficiency in the production. Mm -hmm. So we believe that, for example, these type of policies have also a positive impact and are part of a whole agenda. But let me also talk about other sectors. When we talk about uh, mining for construction materials, the same thing, being more efficient and having a plan of conservation throughout all the production cycle. So yes, clean energy and clean and green economy are creating jobs. We want to do even more. We want to bring the right incentives. And we strongly believe that if we have a green growth uh, vision for the country, we will be leaders in Latin America. And we want Colombia to be the main leader in everything that has to do with clean energy expansion for the next four years, mm. but at the same time that any agricultural project in Colombia is linked with a vision of being efficient in the production cycle and producing a positive impact on climate change. Well, I'm so glad to hear about your concern for the endangered ecosystems of uh, Colombia and hear about some of the steps you're taking to limit that damage. Uh, I want to close by thanking you again. It is indeed a great honor to have you appear during this 24 hours of reality. The entire world uh, wishes you luck uh, with your leadership to confront the climate crisis and uh, empower your people to adapt to the impacts that are already being felt. Thank you so much for joining us and congratulations to you. Thank you so much, Mr. Gore. We know you have been a leader in, uh, in making the world more conscious on climate change, adaptation, prevention, and, and it's a great pleasure for me to participate in this dialogue with you. All the best for you and your team for putting this together. Muchas gracias.